Wow, thanks for the applause. <laughs> um, okay, um, I'm Brianna Coleman, co-president of UJA JCC of Greenwich, and I have a few housekeeping roles. Thank you for keeping your mask on at all times while in the, in the library. Please silence your cell phones. Now would be a great time to do that. And please don't take any photos during the event. Um, books will be available for signing in the lobby after tonight's talk. So I am really, really happy to be here tonight in person to thank you all for coming and for the live stream audience. So thank you live streamers and for those in the audience here. It's really exciting to be in person. Um, when we learned that Evan Osnos was going to accept our invitation to speak, we knew right away that the Greenwich Library would be the perfect partner. Thank you to the library for often collaborating with the UJA JCC when we host major authors. And we're so lucky to have both of you. I, I you know, we got lucky. We have actually two major authors here tonight. Um, and thank you for those that support the UJA JCC and um, all the events that we do, especially this one tonight. And a shout out, oh, also, another pitch for UJA JCC, go to our website, ujajcc.org, to look at some of the other great programming that we have. Um, and a shout out to the Friends of the Greenwich Library, devoted donors and staff who have forged ahead and made Greenwich Library the incredible community facility it is today. The UJA JCC and Greenwich Library, as evidenced by tonight, both work to build community and educate. So thank you to everybody. Let's just give the library a big. And it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's moderator, Andrew Morantz. He and Evan Osnos have at least three things in common. They're both graduates of Greenwich High School. They both uh, are staff writers for The New Yorker. And they're both authors. Okay. Pretty good. Okay, in Angie's case, his latest book title is Antisocial, Online Extremist, Techno Utopians, and the Hijacking of the American Conversation, which was published in 2019 and was named the best book of the year by the New York Times publisher, Publishers Weekly, and others. I'm guessing Andrew and Evan share at least one more thing and love in common. That's Greenwich Library and the love of reading. So thank you for, for hosting tonight's event. Now I have the privilege of introducing Evan Osnos. He's a staff writer at The New Yorker, a CNN contributor, and a senior fellow at the Brookings Institute Institution. Based in Washington, DC, he writes about politics and foreign affairs. Evan served as The New Yorker's China correspondent from 2008 to 2013. His first book, Age of Ambition, Chasing Fortune, Truth, and Faith in, the New Ch in China, won the 2014 National Book Award and was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. In 2020, he published the international bestseller, Joe Biden, The Life, The Run, and What Matters Now, based on interviews with Biden, Obama, and others. Prior to The New Yorker, Evan was the Beijing bureau chief of the Chicago Tribune where he contributed to a series that won the 2008 Pulitzer Prize for investigative reporting. Before his appointment in China, his reporting took him to the Middle East, mainly Iraq. And Evan, I know from the book, which I read, mm -hmm. you have lived in many other places, but we are proud to claim you as a product of Greenwich, where you've moved when you were 10 years old, um, and Greenwich features prominently in your book tonight, Wild Land, The Making of America's Future. One note, we have Evan's ninth grade English teacher from Greenwich High School in the audience. And just her name, it's Esther Bruchel, and she's, I think, here in the front, right here. here, here. And before she knew I was moder before she knew I was introducing Evan a few weeks ago, she said, you know, when he was my, because she was selling the book to the book groups that I'm in with her. <laughs> so she's, you'll get a lot of book sales from, from here, Esther. Here, here, here. She said his, when he was in ninth grade, she used his papers as samples for other students 
to, to copy saying, this is what I'm looking for. So in ninth grade, she knew. So welcome and thank, thank you. you. Thank you, thank you. Okay, here we are. I insisted that we sit on stage for that because I wanted to be showered with <laughs> adulation. Um, are we good? Are our sound levels good? Okay, yeah. Yeah. all right. So thanks for coming, everyone. I love this crowd already. They're very um, vocally responsive to the accolades. I love that. Um, and we're going to talk about Evan's book, which is really a remarkable achievement. It's really a fantastic book. It's an, it's, um, it's an unsettling book at times, but it's a deeply rewarding read. And so if Esther hasn't pushed the book on you yet, I'm going to push it on you. <laughs> you really have to pick it up because it will tell you what's going on with our country in a, in a deep, penetrating way. And we're going to I mean, I think I want to start with, you know, you've said um, you decided to write about three places you've known and loved. I would argue possibly four places with mm. you, if you include DC. So why those places? When did you see the connection? Not sure I love DC. <laughs> so we'll leave that aside. Go three on. places you've loved and one place you've known. And um, <laughs> where, where did you start to see the connections um, forming in your mind where you said, this is a book and this is what we need to understand at this moment about America? Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Andrew, for this conversation. Mm -hmm. For It is really fun to talk about it here with you. Yeah. And I, I just have to say thanks to everybody for coming to the library. I have spent more hours in this building <laughs> pretending to do homework <laughs> than anywhere else on the planet. Uh, I'm sorry, Esther Bouchel. I just, I, I, I put the assignments in eventually. Um, <laughs> but I, I want to say thanks to you specifically for uh, teaching me how to write. And I'm grateful. So, the um, you know this book is a product of the experience of going very far away and coming home, and coming home in a few different ways. I think physically and intellectually. I mean, I as you heard, I lived overseas for a long time, and the process of being abroad. I was particularly in countries that were in the teeth of history in some way. Mm -hmm. Authoritarian countries in the case of China, uh, in Iraq and in Egypt, these are places that are in the midst of tremendous turmoil. And I often found myself in these countries making a case for the United States. Mm -hmm. And I didn't sort of intend to, I didn't do it on the page, but I would do it in conversation. Mm -hmm. I would talk to people and I would say, they, this was in the period of, I went overseas in 2002 and I was there until 2013 and I came back. And in those years, that was a hard time for the United States and its standing in the world. The invasion of Iraq, the effect on America's reputation. And I found myself saying to people, look, we are not perfect, we will make mistakes, but we stand for some basic big ideas, some kind of moral ambitions, like, the idea of rule of law and a basic attachment to fact, the idea that we're committed at least to the pursuit of truth. And the third thing was this essential American idea of the idea that you could pursue a greater opportunity in your life and you could perhaps transform your place, your station, your condition. And the truth was I came back to the United States in 2013 and I found all three of those ideas in doubt under attack in some ways. And this is three years before the election that made us all think about the kind of state of the country. In 2013, it was already beginning to feel that way. Just to give you one data point, in, if you were a child born in the United States in 1940, you stood a 90% chance of out earning your parents. A child born today in the United States stands less than half that chance of out earning their parents. Something fundamentally has changed in that way. And so I had to ask myself, honestly, uh, was I lying to people mm -hmm. overseas? And, and, you, and you note that the, your first day back on the job, the government shuts down. And so you're right away confronted with, and, and that might have been something yeah. uh, that you could see with fresh eyes, having just come from abroad. But. Yeah, I think there is a way in which when you come back, it's like coming home and you see that, you know, the roof tiles are a little raw, <laughs> a little slipping here and there. The front lawn needs some work. And... You do it with love, but it also gives you a moment of a sort of moment of of candor. But the coming home, I have to say, I started work in Washington on October first, twenty thirteen, almost exactly now eight years ago, 
And the government shut down that day. And it, that is a very weird way to move to Washington <laughs> because I called the White House to get my press credentials and I got voicemail. <laughs> and they said, we're sorry, but the, because the government shut down. And then I went over to Capitol Hill and I met these tourists from Finland. And by the way, the book is now somehow gotten is being read in Finland and I'm getting contacted by Scandinavian news organizations saying we want to discuss the Finnish implications of the work. <laughs> like, okay, it's half a page, but all right. But I met these tourists from, from Finland and they were very polite and they were pulling their luggage behind them because all the museums were closed. They had nowhere to go. And they were standing outside the US Capitol and they were asking me, does this happen very often? <laughs> I was like, well, no, it hasn't in 17 years, but, uh, and then they said, well, when will it, when will it be over? <laughs> and I was like, well, that's a complicated question. <laughs> and then it really, and the reason I bring all this up was that was an act of a self-generated crisis. That was, I mean, we don't need to remind ourselves of every gory detail of the government shutdown of 2013, but it was a demonstration to me. It was a sort of tell. Mm -hmm. It was a, a canary in a certain kind of political coal mine mm -hmm. that something was off and that the the political clarity and ambition and work that we had done and which had, I don't want to overstate things, but which had been to some degree a model of the kind I could describe to people in a refugee camp in Burma or in yeah. Beijing. Um, we, didn't, we, didn't, we didn't look like we had been doing enough to shore up that kind of fundamental commitment. Well, so then when you start to see the metaphorical cracks in the stucco or the metaphorical canaries in the coal mine, you then decide to go to literal coal mines. Mm -hmm. So you, so you, so what are the three places you yeah. chose? How did you choose them? How did you choose the people within those places? And, and what is, what does Greenwich have to do with it? Cause this is where we are. So, um, I chose three places where I've lived in my life because I decided if I go to some place for the first time, I won't be able to understand what has changed. Mm -hmm. You can render a snapshot of it, but you don't know what it has gained and you don't know what it has lost. So, um, the, I'll get to Greenwich, I think, third, because yeah. it's probably the one we should think about the most. Yeah. And, but I went first to Clarksburg, West Virginia, which is a small city in the northern part of the state. I, it was my first job out of college, was as a photographer at the Clarksburg Exponent Telegram. That wasn't in your bio, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Though I have to say, it was a marvelous place to be. I was a terrible photographer. <laughs> a terrible photographer. But... Uh, that probably led me to writing, but I had the truth was I'd gotten very interested in the tradition of documentary photography that goes all the way back to Walker Evans and let us now praise famous men. And there is a great tradition of trying to understand our country through the lens. And I wanted to do that for a little while. Mm -hmm. I knew I would always probably write, uh, but I thought there was something useful about being quiet mm -hmm. and just kind of trying to understand by watching a little bit. And um, but what's important about West Virginia in terms of understanding this piece of our country is this town, Clarksburg, is a mostly white, 96% white, and it is coal country. And it is a place that was successful at a certain point not too long ago. I mean, the amazing fact is it used to have a billboard that hung on the, on the main street in town that said, you have a right to be proud. And when I was there, there were still banners that were hanging on the lampposts that reminded people that they were voted the all-American city in 1957. And that was a source of kind of muscle memory of residual dignity. And it was leeching away in a way that people yet hadn't begun to put their arms around, but it was happening. And when I came back in 2013, it was inescapable and very distinct. And I, we didn't yet have a language for it. We didn't call things Trump country yet, but it was very clear to me that this was what was happening. And then I went to Chicago, which is where uh, my family is originally from on the south side of Chicago. And I worked at the Chicago Tribune for nine years. But Chicago also, more importantly, is sort of our ideal location, laboratory for understanding the compounded effects of racial segregation mm -hmm. in this country, wealth, the effects on health outcomes. And I had these amazing experiences of um, coming to see truly how far apart places can be separated by just a couple of blocks. Mm -hmm. I mean, to give you a couple of literal examples, if you live in one part of Chicago, this is not uncommon to be in the neighborhood I write about called Auburn Gresham and to run into kids who have not been to Lake Michigan. 
Lake Michigan is three miles away, and it's a public good. It's owned by them. It's an extraordinary asset, and it's also a civic feature. I mean, if you go back and you look at the way that people like Daniel Burnham talked about creating the city of Chicago, they wanted to generate awe in the physical fact of the lake. And here we have found ourselves in a position for, a, for complicated and interesting reasons where people are three miles away and they're not going to the lake. And I wanted to know why, how, how did that happen? And then the third place was Greenwich. And in some ways, this is probably the place that, it's the place I know most, it's the place I know deepest. I, I grew up here, you know, my family moved here in the 30s and uh, I came up from Glenville to Western to Greenwich High. My family was here for years. My folks have moved into the city uh, more recently, but I, I, I sort of feel like I can speak fluent Greenwich. <laughs> and I wanted to understand how we, this, how we had experienced the last 40 years and how did we factor into this story of the country. And obviously it's not a surprise. Greenwich has been, since the Industrial Revolution, a sort of engine room for understanding American economics. Where do, what is happening? How do the choice, how, what kind of choices are we making? How do we think about what we produce and how we spend and how we save? And how do we contribute to the political process? What role do we play in that process? Um, so those were the ways in which I could take these three very, very different parts of the country and sort of put them into a conversation with one another. And, and I hope kind of give a portrait of the place. Yeah. Well, yeah, so we should, we should uh, you know, let's speak some fluent Greenwich and um, <laughs> let's talk about, I mean, you, you, you mention, you really weave these places and, and various people together seamlessly throughout. I mean, it's not, you know, there is no Clarksburg chapter right. and Greenwich chapter. It's really a, 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 a portrait of uh, many places tied together. But there, there are some sections where you say, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a quote, for example, um, that you know, people in Greenwich tend not to like the caricatures of the right. you know certain types of exclusive country clubs and the conspicuous consumption in it. But you you say among the privileges of living in Greenwich was the right to poke fun at it, and right. that you and so you know there's there's poking fun which you don't actually do in the book, but you but there's a kind of um, there's a kind of taking a, a sort of deep narrative X-ray of a place and and picking apart you know. Which, which parts of the self-conception are true and which parts are not true. So one of the things that, that, that stands out is, you know, this concept of um, what, what, is, what, what is called, this isn't your phrase, but what's called managerial heroin mm. that you, you know, so let, let's tell the story of, of Chip Scourin, which is a big yeah. running theme and sort of where that sense of this kind of metaphorical sense of addiction comes into the story. Yeah, I, Chip's a really interesting case. Chip Scourin moved to Greenwich, um, around 2001, he was a doctor, uh, had been at, trained at Yale, trained at Harvard, and was sick of medicine, was looking to do something different. And a friend said, you should think about Wall Street or think about the finance industry because they're beginning to hire doctors, particularly to make uh, healthcare investments. He knew nothing about it. He went to the bookstore and bought a book called Getting Started in Hedge Funds. <laughs> and I bought it, by the way, and now I'm ready. I'm ready, <laughs> I know how. And he got a job, he worked at SAC Capital, and then he went to another firm, and eventually another firm, he started his own fund. And he did very well. And he made tens of millions of dollars in a short period of time. And then he crossed the line. And he started paying somebody for insider tips on a drug trial that was still in process. And he was arrested and charged with securities fraud. And went to prison, in a sense, for insider trading. And he has been very generous with me in talking about his experience. You know, he came back to Greenwich after going to the, a prison in Pennsylvania for four years and he comes back here and has to figure out who am I? What have I done? How did I get myself into this situation? How much was it my own actions? Right. And how much was I responding to the norms around me in my work, in my competitive environment. He's a guy who had always been competitive. He'd sort of, whatever it was he was doing, he was going to succeed at it. And he got into a world in which there was essentially one metric of success for him. As he said, it was no mystery to me what I needed to do to succeed. I needed to find opportunities yeah. and beat the competition. Well, and I should say the way that this is rendered, it's a very patient, sympathetic portrait of a person. 
and and there are these kind of concentric circles of the personal choices and what led to the the you know consecutive sort of in that case worse and worse choices which are you know rendered in a way that it's not a mystery to you it's very understandable and yet there's also the concentric circle of the people around yeah. him who are setting these sort of cultural norms and then there's the larger concentric circle of society and government and all the rest of it which doesn't seem you know you you note that the concept the phrase white collar crime wasn't even invented until 1939 there wasn't even a term for it because it was sort of invisible yeah you know it's what i in the book in a way that i i don't announce explicitly but is central to the project is that i followed chip's experience of what led him to prison and i followed the experience of somebody else who went to prison named maurice clark mm -hmm. in chicago and I'll tell his story very briefly, just because they are in kind of conversation with each other on the, the page. chapters are called everyone is doing it part one and everyone's doing it part two. So yeah. the, the phrase everyone around me is doing it, you know, that might have a certain valence, but then you flip it to the other valence and it becomes pretty clear. Yeah, I mean, I, I had this. So the when you're doing a, a, a nonfiction book like this, there's sort of an interesting methodological question, which is who do you talk to right. and how do you decide who can help you understand a place or a subculture? Right. And in some cases, you seek people out. And in some cases, they find you. I mean, the way I found Chip Scourin was my brother-in-law went to medical school with him. And he said, oh, you should talk to this guy who has an interesting story. In the case of another, of Maurice Clark, I was in Chicago um, working on a story for the New Yorker about, about shootings on the South Side. And I was standing on the street writing about a shrine that had been erected in memory of a young man, a father of four, who had been killed in a gang shootout. And a guy walked up to me and he said, who are you with? I said, I'm with the New Yorker. And he said, is that the one with the cartoons? <laughs> and I said, yes. And he said, I used to read that in prison. And I said, huh. And his name is Maurice Clark and he is almost my age. And uh, I, within you know, 20 seconds, I said, why did you go to prison? And he was very matter of fact. He said it was attempted murder, 13 years. And he said, if you want to understand what's going on in this neighborhood and why there is this shrine here, I will take you around. And we spent the rest of the day, he got into my car and we drove around for the rest of the day. And that was five years ago. And I've been talking and seeing Reese Clark ever since. And he has been very, amazingly generous with his life and putting it on the page because he knows there is a deep power in that story. What I will say about it is he went to prison for gang crimes committed as a teenager. This is not sweet stuff. This was, you know, an attempted murder of another gang member. But if you understand how he got into that situation, you begin to think of it very differently than if you just see it as one line on the page. Mm -hmm. And I'll just mention one thing about his story, because I think it's kind of amazing. He was a guy who was, uh, he was, he was pretty brilliant, actually, as a kid. Every bit as smart as Chip Scourin or Andrew Morantz. I mean, this guy is a really smart guy. As a kid, he was particularly into math, and he would, he would follow his mom around in the grocery store, and he would tally in his mind the bill, and he would calculate the tax before they would get to the cashier, just to see if he could do it. And he loved math. And then there was a point in eighth grade in Chicago, the school bus is no longer free. You have to pay for the school bus if you're going outside the neighborhood. And his parents couldn't afford to pay for the school bus outside the neighborhood. So they said, you're not going to go to the good high school called Morgan Park. You're going to go to local high school called Fenger High, which is famous in Chicago, very violent and very destructive place. And as he says, very kind of dryly, he says, and so began my life of crime. And the fact is his two brothers were in the Gangster Disciples and off he went. And I am, look, the truth is very, on a personal basis, we are, he's a couple years older than I am. We both had kids around the same time. And it's impossible for me not to look at him and to say, what if that guy had been growing up on Round Hill Road? What if he was sitting next to me at Glenville and Western and Greenwich High? How might his world be different? But not just his world, his son Jeremiah's world and his son's sons. And it, it is a cascade of advantage and disadvantage that I found almost urgently required to put on the page. Yeah. Well, so, and, and, and so you have, you know, in the sort of ever widening fractal concentric circles, right? You have these individuals, Chip and Reese, you have um, their sort of surrounding blocks or schools or neighborhoods. You have 
the kind of norms that are being set. And then you have another real big theme in the book is the kind of societal, governmental superstructure and the connections. You know, there, there, there might be some time as you all start reading the book where you think, okay, well, I get that these things are being woven together, but where, you know, what does Greenwich have to do with the south side of Chicago in this way? Or what does it have to do with West Virginia in this way? And then again and again, you come upon these nexuses of the subprime mortgage crisis in the Clark's case or the paper yeah. coal in the West Virginia case. So were you, I mean, maybe tell us a bit about a couple of those nodes of connection and yeah. were you surprised in the reporting how often that kind of thing would happen or were you? Yeah, it's a great question. I, in the beginning, I was surprised. Yeah. I would come upon a moment of connection. I'll give you an example. Um, in the case of West Virginia, I was writing about a coal company named Patriot Coal, which went out of business. And in the course of going out of business, there was a hedge fund. There were a number of hedge funds that said, this is an opportunity for us. It's a distressed investment. We're going to move in. We're going to do what we can, take out the best pieces of it, and let the rest of it fail. And the, what's fascinating is that makes sense on a business case. And you know, I, you can understand why. I talked to some distressed investors about it. They were like, oh, yeah, that was the thing to do at the time. Coal cases, coal companies were they, were, they were the thing. They were distressed. It was no more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. If you talk to the people who are at the other end of that transaction, it becomes a big part of their politics. There was a coal miner who I talked to named David Ifaw, who was one of the Patriot coal miners. And he said, that was the moment, the moment when, in effect, they found themselves at the blunt end of this kind of transaction, where he began to feel as if something in the system was failing him. He had this line where he said, look, it was never perfect in the old days. Let's not pretend that it was, it was easy. We had bitter strikes with management. That's the nature of the American economic system, particularly in the coal industry. He said, but for a long time, at least we had this sense that our incentives were facing the same direction, that if the company was failing, we would take a hit and the investors would take a hit. But then suddenly there was something happening now in which it felt as if we were gonna take a hit, but they were gonna somehow be okay. And he said, that doesn't make any sense to me. David Ifa, it will not shock you to discover, voted for Donald Trump. And when I asked him about it, I said, why did you vote for Trump? Did you, because Trump, you remember, he put on a coal miner's helmet and he went to West Virginia and he said to people, I'm going to put you back to work. Actually, to quote him verbatim, which is probably worth doing, he said, you're going to be working your asses off. And I said, did you believe that? He said, no, I didn't honestly believe it. He's this, he understands that the economic forces against coal are pretty clear. The environmental direction is obvious. It's a, it's a business on the way out. He said, but he was listening to us and he was talking to us. And that is something that I came away with a very distinct impression of is the number of people who said to me, he was talking to us. He was saying, you have a right to be proud. You have a right to be proud. Yes, that's true. And he was in a sense giving them what they recognized was false, in the end, false hope, but it was permission to tie themselves back into a nostalgic comfort yeah. of the world that they once had pride in. And, and examples like that that keep coming up um, point to this way in which, you know, it can seem that these things are these kind of grand, tragic um, accidents almost. You know, there are these coal miners and they have a tough life and you know it'd be really great if they could get their benefits and their pension but you know it just right. wasn't it just didn't work out that way and then when you read the book you find out there are actually people are who are making those decisions and sometimes as a as a writer of narrative nonfiction, you want to have a detail and you know you're not allowed to make up details but you wish there were a detail that was like if only there were someone who had not only <laughs> a big fancy house with a big wall but literally a life-size chess set <laughs> on which he could move about people on a board so just describe, and in that case, that is actually the founder of that fund that I mentioned did have a house in with a life-size chess set in Greenwich, and it was the largest real estate sale in, of the year in 2019. And those are the moments when you go, okay, there's the sort of layer of poking fun and talking about the, oh, isn't Greenwich so silly with its conspicuous consumption? And then there's the other layer, which is, this is kind of metonymic of the national fabric in, in, in right. the sense that there is a kind of game of life-size chess going on. There are people who are determining the outcomes for other people, but in this distant, invisible way so that no one's really clear on how or why it's happening. 
And the thing that I find amazing about it is that the implications, the, the political repercussions are felt. Mm -hmm. Like we sometimes imagine, well, what is, what is really the impact of somebody living quite that way? Yeah. What's the impact? You know, I remember David E. Faw saying to me, this coal miner, who, you know, he's a guy who did two tours in Vietnam, came back, did the GI Bill, got his de degree in engineering, got a master's in engineering, went into the mines. Pretty smart guy. And he said, he reported to me, he said, you know, there's new data out that shows that the average CEO is now making, or not the average, it was like the, you know, public company CEOs were now making, I mentioned the statistic in the book, mm -hmm. something like 278 times what uh, the median salary of a frontline worker was. And he said, I've never met a man worth 300 times, worth 300 other men. Mm -hmm. Have you? Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, that's a big idea. Yeah. That's a bit of poetry. I mean, he was on, and the thing is, he, there's, so there was a degree to which that dynamic, these kind of thin, these, these thin lines of connection are felt in ways that we don't acknowledge every day. They're bubbling just, just out of view, but they end up shaping the country in a profound way. And I wanted to trace it as specifically as I could, mm -hmm. essentially into the home of a person here and into the home of a person in Clarksburg and a person in Greenwich. Yeah. Because it was honestly, it was for my own kind of understanding. I just wanted to understand how this happened. Yeah. Well, and, and, and there are, there's a, there's a phrase that comes up in the book, psychological distance. Yeah. Where you, you allow yourself, it reminded me actually of a book a colleague of ours wrote called Strangers Drowning, right. like Larissa McFarker, where you have this concept that Peter Singer, uh, this ethicist sort of does this exercise. If a stranger is drowning in front of you and you walk by, you're a monster. If a stranger yeah. is drowning a thousand miles away and you could help, but you don't, yeah. you're morally off the hook. That makes no sense philosophically, but yeah. it's how we experience it. And you know, this concept of psychological distance or totally. physical distance, if you shut down a coal mine and your neighbor suffers, they'll know, but if you shut down a coal mine half a country away, you can kind of get away with it. That sense of psychological distance came up over and over yeah. and over again. I mean, Chip Scowron, if he was talking to you about some of his decisions, he would say it was all abstractions. Mm -hmm. I mean, it were, they were abstractions. They, what, Numbers who, on a who is Honestly, who is in the end going to be, who yeah. is going to be impacted yeah. by this? And I mean, as an example, the, and you know, there's an amazing bit of language that the the second chairman in the history of GE lived in Greenwich. This was back in the 20s and the 30s. He gave this extraordinary speech at Harvard Business School in which he said, he warned of this problem. He said, the more attenuated we become from the people at the, at the end of our own financial transactions, the more risk we take in the ethical calculation. He said his language was, he had a sort of antique phrasing. He said, to sell a spivened horse to somebody in your town, mm -hmm. spivened meaning, I guess, a bad horse, I had to look that one up. I looked it up too. Yeah. <laughs> and a spivened horse to somebody in your town, you're a villain. But to sell it to somebody who lives on the other side of the state, you're a hero. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was actually, he was, it was a prescient warning uh, in his own way. And part of the reason I mentioned it in the book was because one of the things that kept coming up, I quote a number of people in here um, who are very successful in uh, in their own careers in finance over the last generation. And somebody like Seth Klarman at the Balpost in, in, in Boston, he says, I do feel clearly in my life, I see that there is more short-term thinking around me than there was before. He's like, I don't want to romanticize the old days, but it's just obvious to me. It's just mm -hmm. clear that there is more of a willingness now by some people to take, make choices that are going to extract a greater long-term price than there might have been. And he said, and it's sort of, he said, in the end, we either make choices that will preserve our system or somebody, as he said, this is Seth's term, stayed with me, he said, or somebody's going to come along and do it to us. Mm -hmm. And that resonated with me. Mm -hmm. Something Ray Dalio had said to me at one point. You know, Ray Dalio, resident of Greenwich, says, we had a number of interviews for this where he said, you know, income inequality is a national emergency. And he's the one who is citing the data that shows that young people in particular are losing faith in the idea that the system can deliver for them. And he says it, it is on us to restore that confidence. 
by no means is he saying we need to stop working, we need to stop, you know, making investment decisions. He's saying we just need to think about what the implications of individual choices are. Right. Well, to the point of thinking about the implications of individual choices, you then have other people, you have another quote from another um, hedge fund manager who's, who says, there is inequality, but I want to reassure you, it wasn't because good people did bad things. It was unfortunately just a natural, unchecked movement. And you have this kind of tug of war between the people who are saying, we have to recognize that we're making choices, even if they're choices of omission or choices that are just dehumanized on a spreadsheet. And then you have other people saying, what would you have me do? I'm playing within the rules. Yeah. This concept that, I mean, you hear, frankly, Donald Trump say this all the time, that if I you know, didn't pay taxes, it's because I'm just great and I played by the rules. Yeah. What about the concept of pushing to change the rules? Yeah. And, you, know, you have a moment right now where you have uh, companies like Apple and Walmart saying this, where the CEO says, I really hope we can get a bill passed in Congress. And then the business roundtable is lobbying against the bill and they're on the board of the business roundtable, right? You have this double-sided thing. And so how do you think about that on a psychological level? Do, do, is the left hand aware of what the right hand's doing? And what do you think about it on a policy level? How can we get out of this dynamic of there are no bad people, there are no bad choices? Yeah, I think we give ourselves sometimes a refuge in imagining that these are these underlying seismic shifts, yeah. the natural order, almost the movement meteorological, of history, right? The movement of history, the great time. Particularly, we often attribute it to technological change, yeah. and we'll say, "Well, this is the inevitable result of automation," or "This is the inevitable result of a certain movement of capital." And what you find when you get into the details is that, to take just one example, in the ten years that I was overseas between two thousand one and two thousand ten. The amount of money coming into Washington for lobbying and public relations tripled. It tripled. And the effect of that was not because people just wanted to look good in the eyes of you know, the public. Yeah. They were having an effect on the formulation and the specific details of policy. I can tell you in Washington now, when you want to understand a, a finer point of a piece of legislation, very often you call a lobbyist. You don't call a member of Congress. The member of Congress calls the lobbyist. Mm -hmm. And that is, a, that is a distortion of the system. That is not what Madison intended. That's not what Cicero wanted. That That's not. Cicero didn't, <laughs> Cicero wasn't thinking about the, uh, about, about the implications of, yeah. of that. But I mean, I, I, you know, I mentioned Madison partly because Madison did think about the idea that Congress was supposed to serve the will of the people. Right. And I think the biggest fact the biggest fact that I come away with, the thing that sort of began this whole process mm -hmm. was that when I came back to the US, I discovered that there had been this transformation in the public's conception of what government can do and yeah. should do. In 1964, 77% of Americans said they trusted the government to have their best interests. 50 years later, that number has collapsed to 18%. And what's amazing is it's not just one segment of the population. Yeah. It's described that way across the field, left, right, black, white, rich, poor. There is, and for very different reasons, yeah. there is this feeling that there has become this attenuate, this gap, this breaking of the faith between the public and the state. And I think it's important to say all of this begins to help you understand how we eventually get to January 6th. Well, I was going to say, we have this sort of creeping sense of a sort of hum of dread and sort of menace throughout the book. The book has fury in the subtitle. It's, you know, we sort of know it's coming, but yet, you know, you mentioned how Maurice Clark meets you and says, oh, the New Yorker, is that the one with the cartoons? You, you meet another gentleman on January 6th and you say, I'm from the New Yorker, and that is not his response. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> so as you move to what we now know is- Not a subscriber. <laughs> I mean, you get a few free articles before you hit the paywall, so <laughs> maybe he's angry about the paywall. Yeah, it, it's divisive. But do you, um, do you, there is this kind of hum of, I mean, guns are a huge presence in the book. Yeah. The, the lobbying presence of the NRA and then how that filters out into the street. Um, you talk a lot about the Civil War. Um, which, but you're leaving out all the hopes and dreams parts. No, I'm just kidding. Wait, no, we do that at the end. That's how it works. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, but I mean, I guess the question is, do you, you know, given that, you know, national inequality is a right. national emergency and given that faith in these institutions has cratered, what is your sort of sense as you move through this reporting of 
you know, was there any part of you that thought, oh, well, this shock of landing back in my home country will sort of wear off and I'll realize that, you know, I'll put on my rose colored glasses again. Were you shocked that this sort of hum of menace stayed with you? I think that the conditions on the ground uh, got worse. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, in 2015, I went out and covered the beginning of the Trump campaign and our, you know, the, the New Yorker called me. I remember I was in an airport. I was working on another story and our, an editor called and said, hey, would you go cover Trump's campaign? He's just started and you better do it fast because he's probably not going to be in it that long. <laughs> and I went and he said, yeah, we'll just do something quick and funny and get out of, you know what I mean? Short thing. And I go out and I realize this is not funny. Yeah. This is not funny at all. This is actually gets to the very heart of exactly the kind of political corrosion that I've been beginning to collect thinking and writing about. Which is, by the way, not, you know, just sort of plug for the way that the, our sort of semi disappearing craft, which is you don't know until you get out yeah. there and get onto the ground. It, it, you, it could have seemed like a funny story from a distance, right. it did. But the way, what shows up so powerfully in this book is that you just don't know what's happening until you get there. I mean, when I watched the first Republican debate in the home of some Trump supporters in Ohio, and the, the host was drinking out of a coffee cup with a swastika on it. And I said to myself, the fact that there's somebody with a swastika on his coffee cup is not a huge shock. I know there's Nazis out there. But that he would do it in front of a reporter is a sign of something, is, is deeply, deeply wrong. And to the, Mag to the New Yorker's credit, when I came back with that, I said, this is the story. And they said, OK, I think yeah. we'll do that story. Yeah. And, um, but I think the, the, the point that I have to say, the part that surprised me, I had a kind of one of those occasional interviews that you have that transforms your understanding of something. It was with Robert Putnam, the great Harvard scholar who gave us bowling alone a generation ago, the first one of the first things to articulate the idea that we were sort of beginning to withdraw from some of the elements of community. And Robert Putnam was optimistic. And I said, tell me more. <laughs> and he began to lay out, we had a few interviews where he began to lay out the process by which the American pendulum moves. Mm. Because one of the things that is really true is that in politics, you see it very distinctly and very sort of visibly that we tend to vote for somebody who is either, as somebody put it to me once, the remedy or the replica of the person who was in office before. So the replica was George H.W. Bush following Reagan. The remedy was the person who is very different than who comes before. And it's not always a good thing. It's just the opposite. So that's how you get a Donald Trump following a Barack Obama and, and so on. And you see something in our politics, this almost um, in a, on a level that we don't articulate every day, there is this instinct for self correction. Mm -hmm. And this I realized actually, was what I was trying to tell people in all these countries where I was all these years, uh -huh. something in our national character is this capacity for self correction. Mm -hmm. And we have it built in structurally, obviously, every four years, we have an opportunity for a do over. But more deeply, we have a way in which we begin to change our own attitudes. And what Robert Putnam flagged me to was he said, when you look at the way we talk about ourselves as a society, things are not inexorably moving in one direction. We had the Gilded Age followed by the Progressive Era. Mm -hmm. And the Progressive Era, Progressive meant something slightly different than it did today, but it was something that generally, it, I mean, it d delivered huge benefits for the United States. The invention of public high schools, here, here, big fan of public high schools. And, uh, and also the, in, you know, the creation of a lot of the systems which we recognized were necessary to correct the mistakes of the Gilded Age. And the, what he pointed out to me was that the pendulum moves but it doesn't happen on its own. First of all, you have to describe the problem. And at the time you had Upton Sinclair and you had, uh, you had the writings of that period that really began to alert particularly powerful people, educated people in this country. There's wonderful examples of people um, who were essentially American aristocrats of the early 20th century who began to read about the scale of the problem and the risks it posed to the future of capitalism and began to make different choices mm -hmm. to the point that actually in the, at the height of the progressive era, every major pre presidential candidate, Teddy Roosevelt, everybody was running as a progressive. Yeah. 
And I found that kind of fascinating. So Putnam's point to me was the pendulum moves, but you have to push it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, and so, you know, the, the notion that we are in, you know, it's funny because we, nobody, nobody wants to, you know, write this grand narrative account and then be asked, okay, well, is the bill going to pass next week or whatever? And yet, this is what I keep seeing people asking you on TV. <laughs> right, right. But I, I, I think a way of, you know, by the way, the bills are going to pass. Anyway, sorry, I just had to say it. <laughs> All right, good. We got, that's free, that's free punditry. But, um, but the notion that we've come, that, this notion that the pendulum, you know, is being, it, it feels that we're at an inflection point where yeah. we could be, you know, heading into a progressive age or a gilded age even more than we are now. And you could be at the moment when we were saying, wasn't it crazy that we didn't have universal pre-kindergarten pre right. in this country, you know, a year ago? Or yeah. you could be heading into a moment where, you know, the ideological precursors have been laid for, you know, U.S. senators to say that spending 1% of GDP on fixing roads is not socialism, it's communism. Mm -hmm. um, and the ideological precursors of that are, are also to be found in this book. Yeah. So can you speak to, I mean, another phrase that, that, that stuck out to me is this notion of seeing the, the ruins, but not the hurricane. Mm. This notion that these things do have ideological precursors. Those are choices just as much as the financial outcomes are choices. How did we get from, you know, a, another Greenwich figure, Prescott Bush, saying, yeah. you know, having the courage to raise the necessary revenue yeah. to a moment when the, the most sort of modicum of you know in line with the rest of the industrialized world investment in public infrastructure is considered communism how, how yeah. did we get there i think you know prescott bush uh as people will remember who was the father and grandfather of presidents um you know he plays a role in this book because he was an extraordinary measure of his moment i mean here he was he was the uh, moderator of the rtm he was eventually senator from the state of connecticut he was uh, Eisenhower's golf partner, eight-time champion at the Round Hill Club. Um, and he was, in many ways, a kind of perfect indicator of what was described at the time as modern republicanism. Mm -hmm. And he had these lines. When you go back, and I went back and was reading the way he talked at the time in Congress about the role of somebody like him, mm -hmm. as he thought of himself, I'm somebody who's made a lot of good choices in my life. He had succeeded extraordinarily well in business. He was also um, aware of the fact, as he put it, that if we want this country to remain what it is, we have to make prudent, wise, but serious investments in things like research and development, the education system, welfare. He was kind of small p progressive, and he was a mainline powerful Republican figure. Mm -hmm. And you look at the things that he was saying now, and I mean, if you put them into the context of where the party is today, he has fallen very far away. And interestingly, George Romney, father of Mitt Romney, was saying a lot of very similar things. Yep. George Romney, as people may remember, turned down a salary increase because he thought it was unseemly. He didn't want to be regarded quite that way. And so I think I, I come to this question of norms a lot, which is a dreadful word. I mean, it's a kind of, it's, it's not a word that makes people stand up and really rejoice <laughs> with clarity, but it's it's essentially yeah. everyone was doing it. It's one of those concentric circles, yeah. Yeah, it's I mean because it's about shifting what the expectations yeah. are. I mean, you asked a hard question, which I am evading because I don't know honestly <laughs> how we got to the point that Marco Rubio, who was considered the thinking wing of the party a few years ago, is somebody who says that investing in roads is as he said, with not socialism, but Marxism. Um, I mean, this is now we're into a game of language. And I, I do look at that in, in the book because I think the language is extraordinarily mm -hmm. powerful. Yeah. And the way that we allow people to say things that are patently untrue yeah. um, is part of the reason why you end up getting to the point where you have kind of open season on the facts. Yeah, yeah. And, and um, this is, as you say, happening everywhere, you know, I think it's sort of easy for us, I'll use the, you know, an I statement, um, to sit here and say, oh, those poor benighted souls in West Virginia, right. um, oh, those, those, you know, rubes who stormed the Capitol. Um, but, you, you know, you, you are careful to point out in the book, and I'm just going to read a little bit, um, the portrait 
of liberal cosmopolitans appalled by Trump obscured a potent element of American politics. The executive class of the Republican Party was wealthier, more conservative, and more politically active than their forebears in ways that were helping Trump edge closer to the White House. The story of Trump's rise was often told as a hostile takeover. In truth, it was something closer to a joint venture. And so I just want to implicate everyone equally here. Right. Um, and, and just to sort of say, you know, what is the joint venture and how do we change the terms of that joint venture? You know, how do we build something, yeah. as you say, where we don't stop the earth from rotating and end everything as we know it, but we build a, a sort of race to the top rather than to the bottom? I, I think part of it is um about appreciating the potential for disaster mm. by which i mean there are a number of folks who decided early on in the 2016 presidential election that donald trump is not he's vulgar he's offensive to me i wouldn't really want to have him at my dinner table but i'm going to vote for him because in the end i think he's advancing policy choices that are going to advantage me or my business or my ideological ambition. And what would you have me do? I can't vote for the other person. I can't vote for the other person. I have reasons why I don't want to. Yeah. And so it seems like a fair thing to do. And, and one of the things that you heard over and over again is what's the worst that can happen? Institutionally, we're strong. We are a resilient country that has invested. We have things like the world's leading public health agency, the Center for Disease Control. Yeah. So what if he puts a couple of yahoos in as political appointees? Yeah. What harm can he do? And I came to see a pattern of what I would describe as a failure of catastrophic imagination, mm -hmm. because that's part of how you come to the decision to say, I know that my, this choice on the page, this transaction is probably going to cause a lot of mayhem in this place that's far away. But there are systems that will help people in that situation. Mm -hmm. They'll adjust. They'll figure out. Mm -hmm. But the truth is, catastrophe happens. Mm. And, it, and sometimes it doesn't reveal itself until it's too late. And so when the pandemic happened, I really did feel as if it was a failure of imagination. And that reminded me of something. I was a young reporter covering the war in Iraq. And I spent a lot of time, I was just the other day with some of the folks in the national security world who were involved in making that decision to go into Iraq. And they after now having the sort of time and the distance to be able to talk about it clearly to themselves, will say that was a failure of imagination. We did not imagine how, not only how badly the invasion could go, how badly the war could go, but what the effects would be on the United States. Mm -hmm. And I see a pattern there. And so I think the one thing I come away with is this feeling that when we cast our vote, which is after all our kind of most solemn duty, we should be more catastrophic in our imagination. You heard it here, folks. Be more <laughs> catastrophic. Um, we will still end on hope because we have some time for audience questions, right? So um, we won't end on catastrophic imagination. But um, yeah, do we want to raise hands or how are we going to do this? Catastrophic imagination is not something you see on a bumper sticker very often. <laughs> I may not have a mind for political marketing, I think. I had. Is this I had two, um, like, I don't know if they're related questions, but you said you, when you lived abroad that you found yourself making the case for America. What have you found yourself making the case for since you moved back to Americans? And also just what do you miss most about living in Beijing? Yeah, oh, thanks. I, I, uh, the, the thing I, I think the thing that I miss most about living in Beijing is, uh, the pace of change, which is to say, like in China, you would, I lived there for eight years, and very often, this is not a, 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 an abstract example, you would go away on a trip for two weeks, and you'd come back, and somebody had knocked down your next door neighbor's house and built another house, <laughs> or at least gotten substantially <laughs> towards the process of completing the new house. There was a level of kind of almost madcap creation that was going on. Now, I need to state pretty clearly, I write a lot about authoritarianism and the problems of it and the ways in which it chokes off innovation and chokes off human flourishing. But the sheer dynamism of the place is extraordinary. And part of the reason why they're running into trouble now is because that dynamism is being choked off by institutional restraints. But when we came back to the US, my wife, Sarah Beth, said, you know, it's wonderful to be home. But she said the thing that was fun about China was when you go to the market in Beijing to go buy a tomato, you have no idea what the hell is going to happen to you. 
like very weird things happen all the time, wonderful kind of strange things. And, uh, and here it's, it's a pretty predictable experience, actually. Um, Every time I get an acai bowl, I'm it's the same, it's the same. Um, and then the question, the thing about what I make a case to, I think I would tie these two questions. I think you, you made a good point about, in a sense, what case do I make to Americans? The case I actually make to Americans when I think about what I saw in China, what because I, I go back to China still periodically several times a year, not since the pandemic began, is a willingness to sacrifice there in, in service of this larger objective. And I'm not talking about the fact that the government will come along and you know take away people's land and say it's a sacrifice for the purposes of the nation. No, individually, people are willing to suffer actually in order to advance their own family and their own individual interests. In Chinese, it's called eating bitterness. Cool. The idea of eating bitterness is a really powerful part of people's lives. And you know, I don't want to be grumpy, kind of old man, get off my lawn for a moment. But uh, that's how I feel a little bit when I look at we're not we're not really quite attuned to the benefits of sacrifice in ways that we have been at other moments in our history. And we valorize it. We talk about the greatest generation for a reason. So, you know, if I make sort of one policy idea that in that spirit, it's that I am struck that there is actually, you hear it among young people, there is a longing for the possibility of service to something larger than ourselves. And for some people that's military service, but for a lot of people, it might be something else. And if we created a possibility for that, some kind of civilian sacrifice, some civilian contribution, the idea that you could go and work for a year or two and that it would be regarded, it would be, it would be celebrated by all of us as a great thing to have done for a couple of years, we'd be doing ourselves a lot of favors, I think. There's a CCC in the bill. Yeah, exactly. Um, I haven't had a chance to read. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I read your article in the New Yorker, but on, on Greenwich, and I'm really looking forward to the book. You make the point, you, you ask the question, how did we get to this situation? And take your one statistic, uh, 1964, there was respect for government, and you said recently only 18% think government works. Well, we have whole industries undermining government. We have think tanks, we have giant media, um, we have the lobbyists themselves. Uh, many businessmen, you know, buy into, you know, they want to lower these taxes, they want to get rid of regulation. And so these are very powerful forces that, yeah. and it's an, it's an all day assault. And then what's happening with, you know, with the, the big lie and so on, uh, all of this gets quite discouraging, but, but then on the other side, you said other people um, are discouraged with government and that's because we don't seem to be effective in resisting uh, the big lie. We haven't brought, you know, we haven't brought people to justice. We haven't uh, been able to somehow um, get us back on the right path. And, and that way, uh, the left is discouraged and yeah. feel government's ineffective. So yeah. I don't think it's an accident that we got this way. I think it's a powerful industry and we need to fight back and resist. I 100% agree with you. And actually, I mean, I, I, you've identified a key fact. One of the things that I'm sort of, one of the subtexts of the book is that determined effort to essentially undermine the credibility of government. Um, and one of the questions is, well, how do we fix that? You know, part of it is about calling out the effect of money in politics. And there is some incredibly interesting and easy, I don't mean to sort of say it's politically easy, but it's almost shockingly apparent what kinds of fixes we could do. Look at some legislation proposed by John Sarbanes of Maryland, for instance, financial, more or less ways of reigning in money in finance, in, uh, in, in politics, um, that would have a real effect on how people feel about the state, the functioning of the state. The other fact is, you got to win elections, and you got to get rid of people who are seeking to undermine the functioning of the state. And I mean, when, you, when I talk to Republicans in Washington, essentially Republicans have sort of fallen away from where the party is, who feel that no longer represents them in any real way anymore. They will often say the only way to beat this moment is to win elections. Uh, put people into government who actually want to see it thrive and see it serve people's interests. I think we'll have time for one more question.
Hi, great. It's so great to have you here. And I did read the book the day it came out. So excited. Following up, um, Thank you. Uh, really personally close and um, part of the group and the RTM and, and all sorts of things that were happening in your book in chapter 15 and yeah. otherwise. So really appreciated the book. Thank um, you. Something that really stood out to me in interviews that you've been doing and talking about is that fact checking project that you yeah. did out of China. And I think it's really relevant. And I thought for folks, especially who haven't yeah. read the book yet, just kind of it's relevant to us today. How do we talk about fact checking and making it impossible for people to tell lies? And we're talking about Reddit again. Yeah. No, I, I love that you raised that. I mean, it's fact checking. Uh, it, it's the kind of thing, it's like the least glamorous thing in the world. And it's actually it's so powerful. It is, it's almost an entire philosophy. Look, at the New Yorker, we have this system. As anybody here, if you've ever been fact-checked by the New Yorker, you know that it is slightly more invasive than a proctological visit. It is <laughs> so thorough. I mean, they would say, they call you up and they would say, Evan has written that, uh, you know, that you, Andrew, were wearing a gray jacket. Was it gray or charcoal? How would you characterize it? Using your own language, not his language. And they go through that throughout the whole process. I was almost late to this because <laughs> I was talking to a fact checker about whether we could say Instagram <laughs> can make teenagers more depressed or it does make teenagers more likely to be depressed. And this is like a half hour conversation. Yeah. <laughs> and the reason why I mention all this is that it's, there's actually a whole kind of revival of the cult of fact checking because it's a rebuttal to this age of illusion and disinformation and the idea that you can't believe anything and that it's all lies. Actually, epistemologically, there is worthy, it's worthy of ambition. You can clarify and ascertain the facts. And I had this experience in China once, you know, China is a place in which people are raised basically with the understanding that the government will be lying to them for large portions of the day. And so it creates a kind of cynicism. Hannah Arendt actually wrote beautifully about the effect that has. It makes you begin to question anything. And I think you could argue there are something similar here. It's not that the government is lying to you all the time, but if you're surrounded by the media you're consuming that is telling you things that aren't true, you begin to doubt. Yes, nothing is true and anything is, it's Putinism, essentially. But what's fascinating is, so in China, the idea of fact-checking has taken on this almost kind of talismanic quality. I remember once some friends said, would you come and just talk about how the fact-checking at the New Yorker works to some journalists? I said, yeah, sure. So I show up at the appointed hour and I figured I'd have, you know, three or four kind of ragged reporters wanting to take notes about this process. And there was an auditorium filled with 300 people, people sitting in the aisles. I mean, on every word, listening to how this process of ascertaining the facts work. And then somebody taped it, transcribed it, and it circulates on the internet in China as this kind of document. It's nothing to do with me, but this document about how you can ascertain the facts. And I mention that because we're at a pretty fragile moment in terms of recommitting ourselves to the idea that facts are both real and ascertainable and, and worthy of protecting. And, you know, I have little kids and I think a lot about trying to figure out how to raise them in an environment in which I'm separating for them what is true and what is false and telling them that we should, in a sense, reward people who are saying the truth and, and punish people who are telling lies in public life. So. Well, everybody, if you haven't bought it yet, Go buy the book. If you know someone who works at a hedge fund, tell them to buy it out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Abby. My pleasure. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. That was fun. Thank you.